Welcome to lecture number nine, Feminist Research. We have so far mainly learned and discussed the how-to of putting together a research design. And we have been looking into the difference between quantitative and qualitative methodologies and methods about how to put together a research design. But one may feel that so far we have been missing a sort of spirit, if you like, of a research design. The tone, or to put it more straightforwardly, the political orientation of the research design. And this is what we are starting to do in this lecture and continue to do in the next lecture. Today we are going to discuss feminist research as a political orientation to investigate social issues. And in the next week, we are going to discuss how colonialism is implicated in research and how we may decolonize our ways of doing social research. The first step should be to give a broad definition of feminism. And we need to make clear that feminism is a family of discourses, modes of thought and practices that includes a very wide range of different feminisms. And nevertheless, we will try to give a definition that can help us orientate the direction we are leading towards in this week's lecture. So feminism can be defined as a family of critical perspectives about social and political life that especially draws attention to the ways in which social, political, cultural, and economic norms, practices, and structures are experienced differently by women. Now, when we say experienced differently, we in fact mean that we are looking into the injustices of these norms, practices, and structures. That is what feminism does. We know that power relations structure our social life, but we less pay attention to the fact that power relations also affect the way we do social research. From a feminist point of view, this means that this kind of influence in social research may cause to exclude certain questions and to create particular kinds of knowledge that either do not address women or address them in ways that perpetuate inequality and exploitation. This is why social research needs a political spirit. It needs a way to look into questions of inequality and justice in order to create knowledge that may help society to cure those inequalities. This means that feminist knowledge emerging from feminist research framework generally will not align with existing disciplines and the way these disciplines design social research, but in fact, feminist knowledge is constructed through a critique of those disciplinary boundaries and the ways they do research. This also means that feminist research 
is skeptic about the universal claims that existing disciplinary frameworks make about social reality. Universal claims that in fact represent the lives of men and not of people. So then, what is feminist research? How it addresses existing dynamics of power, knowledge, social relationships, and the supremacy of men in that knowledge. Strictly speaking, feminist research need to develop a sort of feminist ethic that will guide research decisions to find out about these existing structures of power. A feminist research ethics pays attention to four dimensions. The first is the power of epistemology, that is, it pays attention to the ways by which we produce knowledge. A second dimension is that of boundaries, marginalization, silences and intersections, which means that a feminist ethics looks into how, what can be said, to what extent women can act, when their voices are silenced, and so on, how all these phenomena takes place in social life. A third dimension is that of relationships, not just in social life, but also in social research between researchers and their subjects. And a fourth dimension is that of positionality or the socio-political coordinates of the researcher. You can find more about these in Brooke, Ackerley and Jackie True um, article referred to here, though this is not the one that you will find in Moodle for this week reading. The way we frame our research questions and the theoretical discourses that we use in our research design to frame those questions are decisive in the sense of the kind of knowledge that we are going to produce. So, for instance, in the issue of the politics of abortion, feminist researchers will reject the discourses of the right of the parents versus the right of the fetus or the idea of pro-life and instead will try to put forward discourses that are about the rights of women to make decisions about their own bodies and reproductive choices. In this way, they will be able to produce a sort of knowledge that emphasizes the experiences of women. Feminist research conceives disciplinary boundaries as one more way to restrict the way we think about social life and the way we think about the experiences of women in particular. Disciplinary boundaries forces us to ask particular research questions within those fields. So, for instance, if we take the example of the phenomenon of oppression, if you are in race studies, you will be expected 
to research issues of oppression that relate to race. If you are a Marxist scholar, you will be expected to investigate issues of class mainly related to oppression and so forth. But luckily, feminist scholarship created the idea of intersectionality, which basically says that in order to understand how we experience opp oppression, and particularly how women experience oppression, we need to look at the ways by which different and overlapping forms of oppression towards women are applied in their everyday life. Two more issues that um, comprise um, the ethics of feminist research are one is the attentiveness to the relationships between us as researchers and the subjects of research and the relations of power that are obviously implicated in those relations. So. In fact, with the view of trying uh, to break down traditional hierarchies between researchers and the subjects of research, what in fact happens is that most feminist researchers will be engaging with a sort of more qualitative, flexible research design, which gives um, a lot of uh, place to the perspectives of the people that we investigate. And the last dimension in um, a feminist um, research ethics is the attentiveness to our positionality, to the location that we occupy as individuals and researchers. I mean, to our identity, uh, both as uh, persons and as scholars, as researchers, and how that location in society may impact the way we envisage the research design, the sort of questions that we ask. We should be open to be uh, self-reflexive to that positionality and uh, see how the place that we occupied in society um, influences the uh, sort of research enga engagement that, um, that we choose. And yet, the fact that feminist researchers will be inclined to adopt a more qualitative research design for both the flexibility of methods and um, the um, centrality that it bestows upon the perspectives of um, the subjects of research, those people and communities that we investigate. Um, in fact, there is no unique feminist research method as um, theorist um, Anne Tickner uh, states. Um, in fact, um, research design uh, drawing from feminist perspective maybe find themselves using a variety of methods, not just those from the more qualitative um, uh, frameworks, but also um, from the more quantitative sort of framework. Because what is important is not which kind of method we use, but um, at which kind of service in the sense of the production of knowledge, we are putting those methods uh, to. So the real questions are not about methods, but about 
um, the sort of um, knowledge that we aim to produce, which should be directed at um, uncovering and criticizing the um, structures of power that favor men and the structures of social research that favor surfacing uh, that sort of knowledge. There is a very important implication in the fact that um, we claim that our research design is um, um, imbued by a political perspectives such as feminism. Um, this is not just about asking questions that um, adopt a critical tenor towards the structures of power in society and towards um, uh, the strict disciplinary boundaries and towards um, the way um, we produce knowledge. It is even more than that. Asking those kind of questions and adopting those sort of research design uh, aim at uncovering those issues, uh, that uh, activity is patently political. This means that this kind of research, feminist research, has the very clear goal not just to um, bring um, um, to us new discoveries in the sense of how we understand society and the power relations that are at their base, but also we aim at changing those structural relations. And this is very important uh, because it means that every time that we engage in a research design um, that has a feminist orientation that draws its um, attentiveness from feminist issues, it means that we are aiming on putting, putting the spotlight on an issue with the view of changing uh, the way things are being conducted in that particular angle of social relations. These three examples um, illustrate that feminist research um, is not interested in other sort of issues regarding social life. It is not interested in bizarre or esoteric sort of dimension of society. The, the emphasis is elsewhere. The emphasis is on the fact that feminist research um, frames the very same issues uh, that non-feminist research engage with, but with a different perspective of what power relations mean for women. So it is about of um, framing differently those issues, it is about introducing into those issues um, um, other dimensions that are not present or are silenced in non-feminist research. And it is about a particular way of asking questions in order to bring to light um, um, the injustices towards women in society. So let's try to put together what we have uh, discussed so far in terms of the ethics of feminist research and the examples that we went through and look into what uh, Anne Tickner suggests as four basic methodological guidelines that should inform um, feminist research perspective. So this guidelines are, first, a concern with which research questions we get to ask. Second, we should be designing research projects that are useful to women. Third, every research design drawing from a feminist perspective should give attention to questions of reflexivity and the issue of the subjectivity of the researcher. 
And fourth and lastly, this kind of research design should be committed to create knowledge as a form of emancipation, as something that can actually help women in society and politics. Okay, so let's see how these guidelines actually work. What does it mean that feminist research asks feminist questions? Let's take the case of international relations. This is a field that is very close to us and see what actually conventional research obviously dominated by men in international relations has been asking since the discipline was founded around the beginning of the 20th century. So the main questions in international relations were either about the behavior of states as wholes, how particular states are more powerful than others. Today there are um, questions and even fields dealing with the issue of security. And the discipline also assumed in a very Hobbesian manner from Tho Thomas Hobbes' work that um, the international arena um, is inherently anarchical unless some kind of organization is imposed upon. So this means that the issue of international cooperation um, across nations and states was always very important in the discipline and also how international peace can be achieved. So these are the sort of questions that always characterize the international relations discipline and I believe still does. Now let's look into what feminist research may ask from within the discipline. It is not that feminist perspective in international relations will not be preoccupied with the concerns, the issues, or the themes that I just mentioned. But in feminist research, we approach those issues with other preoccupations in mind, and we try to ask questions that are different for, from the more conventional way of doing research in international relations. These three questions here quite represent um, um, the range of concerns that can be raised um, in relation to the most basic assumptions of how the international system of state um, is organized from a more conventional point of view. So, a first question can be, why in just about all societies are women disadvantaged politically, socially and economically relative to men? And to what extent is this because of international politics and the global economy? So here we are asking in fact how the way that international politics conducts itself and the ways that the global economy works have influence over the structures of gender inequality within societies. Another way to ask a similar question from a slightly different um, um, angle would be, in what ways do these hierarchical gender structures of inequality support the international system of states and contribute to the unevenly distributed prosperity of the global capitalist economy. So what we are doing in this question is to turn around the variables that we had in the first question and in fact ask to what extent 
the gender structures of inequality within societies are supporting inequality across the globe. And a third kind of question, very typical of feminist research in IA, would be how do gender structures of masculinity and femininity legitimate war and militarism for both women and men? Now, these three questions are not exhaustive of, obviously, all that can be asked in relation uh, to the more conventional themes that I are engaged with. But what is important about this way of asking question is that we are trying to suggest that there is a structural relation to be investigated between gender inequality within societies, within nations, and the way that international system is organized at its different level, um, either if it's about the global economy, war and peace, militarism, and even uh, um, other sort of um, cultural relations between the nations. It is about the way we ask questions, it is about the sort of angles that we choose to engage with on the articulation of those questions that is directed at producing knowledge that not only, and I'm stating this one more time, not only uncovers um, um, the injustices um, towards women at different levels, but also it empowers women in the way to uh, change the existing social relations in society. The second methodological guideline that Ann Tickner suggests for feminist research is about how women should uh, use their experiences to design research that is actually useful to women. So, in other words, the knowledge that we produce in feminist research need to be used by women to change their oppressive conditions. An example of this is how, for instance, Marilyn Waring in 1988 and many others afterwards have documented how national income data in different states actually ignore the reproductive and carrying tasks and labor of women at home and outside home that are officially, generally classified as economically inactive or unoccupied. Most of this labor is, um, still is, unpaid labor and it is uh, regarded as a feminine space of labor um, uh, devoid of actual work and women have been producing knowledge um, that um, enriched the uh, statistical data that uh, states have available in order to influence public policy which in many cases still uh, ignore the um, enormous um, uh, space that women create um, during these tasks. So here you have a very clear example about how looking into how we live into social relations can help us understanding better um, the oppressive conditions of women and how the knowledge that can be produced out of such kind of research can perhaps help to redesign public policy. The third component in Tickner's um, methodological guidance is reflexivity. And this is about understanding uh, the positionality of the researcher 
uh, in relation uh, not only to the subject matter but also to the subjects of the research, to the participants, to the people that we actually investigate. And um, this is um, a very emphasized in feminist research, uh, considering that um, feminist researchers, um, more in more cases than uh, men researchers, are very sensitive to the fact that the very participants that they investigate are very close in their everyday experiences to those experiences that the researchers themselves have been going through. So this kind of understanding help feminist researchers to break down the divides with the participants and treat the evidence and the experiences that they are being shared by the participants with much respect uh, and as a true asset for the production of feminist knowledge. And the fourth and last component of Tickner's um, methodological guidelines for feminist research is understanding that we see knowledge as a form of emancipation. So, this is really very interesting. Um, feminists um, do not believe that it is possible or even desirable to separate what we think um, that is, how we think about social life and which kind of knowledge we can produce about social life um, um, from um, the actual life that we investigate. They see these two realms, in fact, as just one. And in fact, this is to say that feminist social research is part and parcel of the historical movement of feminism to improve women's life around the world. So, knowledge as emancipation means that in feminist research, we do have a very clear goal of empowering the lives of women by producing knowledge that can be actively put at work in their own life. We could at this stage um, enrich the lecture by looking into more examples from um, more strictly speaking academic journals and social research that has been published in these journals and other uh, outlets like for instance academic books. But instead I have chosen to look into this particular book Invisible Women um, written by Caroline Emma Criado Perez who is a Brazilian British feminist She's an activist and a journalist, and she has put together an amazing book that I strongly suggest all of you to read, um, which is based on a very rich range of secondary literature, um, which is mainly qualitative analysis and quantitative research that has been done on different aspects of social life that expose the bias uh, against women in the way we produce and use data about our social life. So what we're going to do in the um, rest of this lecture is to go through uh, some of the uh, chapters book um, and see what invisible women um, have to offer in the sense of illustrating the points that we have made so far in the lecture. Criado Perez's book is about gender data gap. What does it mean and how the data gap about gender influences the way we live, 
how space is constructed, how policy is shaped, and so on. So, what the book argues is that the world is basically built on male data. That is, everything that we know about how we do things, how we live, the data accumulated about our ways of life and characteristics is based on a body that is not universal, but is the male body. And it's not just the male body, it's the white, able-bodied, mean man. The author says in the introduction, one of the most important things to say about the gender data gap is that it is not generally malicious or even deliberate. Quite the opposite. It is simply, simply the product of a way of thinking that has been around for millennia and is therefore a kind of not thinking, a double not thinking even. Men go without saying and women don't get saved at all. Because when we say human on the whole, we mean men. What is new is the context in which women continue to be the other. And that context is a world increasingly reliant on and enthralled to data, big data. Artificial intelligence have been trained on data sets that are riddled with data gaps. And because algorithms are often protected as proprietary software, we can't even examine whether these gaps have been taken into account. On the available evidence, however, it certainly doesn't look as if they have. The book, the different chapters and episodes in the book, is all about showing to us, based on an analysis of secondary literature, that is, research that exists, what is the gender data gap, how it comes into being, and how societies and state use that gender data gap to build policies and the various characteristics of the way we live. One of the themes that Criado Perez studied is the relation between men, women, transportation planning and snow clearing. Well, in those countries where in winter, in winter particularly, there is a need to clear roads, walkways, avenues and so forth. She looked into how Sweden changed its planning of snow clearing following research that discovered that the way that particular cities in Sweden were implementing snow clearing in winter was affecting men and women differently because men and women travel differently. In the past, this snow clearing policy or implementation began with the major traffic arteries, then public transport avenues and roads, and ended with pedestrian walkways and bicycle paths. The problem is that researchers saw that in general, men are those who will be driving to work, and even if there is just one car in the family, it will be the men in average that will be using the car to drive to workplace, whereas women in average, will tend to use public transportation or just walk, either to workplace or to other spaces. So once they understood that this way of snow clearing was affecting the uh, possibility of women to carry on with their lives and their everyday tasks, they changed this policy. Public toilets. We can find nowadays in some public spaces toilets that are 
define as gender neutral and this is intentionally to keep up with the rhythm of change in the way we understand today gender. However, in practice, the author finds that this gender neutral kind of to toilet is expanding the time that men can use toilet and the number of toilets that are available to men, whereas are inflicting harm in the possibility of women to use toilet. And this is because, as you can read here, there are a number of reasons, physical and other, that women spend more time in toilet and tend to use toilet more than men. So in fact, but taking toilets that were before either for men or for women and make them gender neutral, we are not providing equality in this realm. And in fact, we are reducing both the spaces and the time available to women when they need to use toilet. Again, on the one hand, the gender neutral toilet tries to keep the pace with politics and culture, but in fact, again, it is relying on what the author called invisible women or data that cannot see the needs of women. There are women who mainly work as caregivers at home and there are women that do also, apart from their work at home as caregiver, they also work outside home in some workplace. The problem is, as we mentioned this today, is that in many countries the official statistical data that is gathered on labor and the economy doesn't see the work produced by women as actually labor. And it misses the fact that this is work that is very important for the social reproduction of family, of individuals, for society to function, but it's work that is not being paid. Globally, 75% of unpaid work is done by women who spend between three and six hours per day on it compared to men's average of just mere 30 minutes to two hours. And this imbalance starts at a very early stage when you see at home that girls as young as five do significantly more household chores than their brothers. It is also very rare for men to take on the more personal, messy, emotional draining aspects of elder care work. In the UK, for instance, up to 70% of all unpaid dementia carers are women. Women are more than twice as likely as men to be providing intensive on-duty care for someone 24 hours a day and to have been caring for someone with dementia for more than five years. Female carers also tend to receive less support than male carers, so they end up feeling more isolated and being more likely to suffer from depression. An Australian study found that while little leisure time women do have is more fractured and combined with other tasks than men's. The upshot of all these analysis in these parts of the book is that with very few exceptions, women work longer hours than men. 
and he, this has deep impacts on their health and their well-being. If only all these data would be implemented in the way governments plan public policy and decide to fund public institutions, it is to believe that this can be changed. The gender pay gap. Well, we can say that this is not an area of um, gender data gap because this information is in fact available. So for instance, in Australia, the full-time gender pay gap is 14%, which means that women earn on average $241.5 per week less than men. This is in average. In terms of where the gender pay gap is the lowest and the highest, so the lowest is in South Australia and the highest in Western Australia. Whereas in terms of industries, the lowest gender pay gap is in retail and the highest in financial and insurance services. So what is the problem? If we have this data, this data is available, the problem again is that the governments don't use it to plan policy and to change this gap. One of the main discourses that dominate the um, uh, world of labor um, is the idea that um, if people study what they need to study for the skills and they perform excellently and they work hard, so they will get jobs and they will be promoted and advance in their careers in their workplace. Or in other words, this is the idea of meritocracy. But however, when we look into the gaps between men and women in different industries, we find that something still needs to be explained. It is not just about merit. For instance, if we look into academia, we find that women in the United States make up only a quarter of the tech industry's employees and only 11% of its executives. Though on the other hand, if what you need to get to those positions is education, well, women are more than a half of all undergrad, undergraduate degrees in the United States. Worldwide, particularly in the areas of STEM, science, technology, engineering, these areas, the higher positions in schools and faculties are dominated by white, middle and upper class men. There are also issues in terms of quotation and also in the way students criticize and assess their female teachers compared to their male teachers. Everywhere business are still dominated by men. So the way workplaces are built physically in terms of its door, the use of glass, hallways, ignore the fact that m women also work in those areas. Even the way the office temperature is set is only to follow the metabolic characteristics of men, not women. And the same is to say with the issue of injuries in workplaces that are not relying in data about women with which many of these injuries could be avoided. 
women are overrepresented in precarious work all around the world. In Australia, 30% of women are in casual employment compared to 22% of men. This situation surely exacerbates the gender pay gap and increases the violations of rights and the violence against women. Did you know that different sorts of equipment from certain musical instruments like pianos to smartphones are all designed around the average male hand as if this size fits for all. Google speech recognition software is 70% more likely to accurately recognize male speech than female speech. And we already mentioned that artificial intelligence algorithm are male bias in their design. There are many more examples of how to use research about society and the place of women in order to leverage it in feminist politics in this book. This is the end of this lecture.